Welcome to the Media Bolt Podcast, where we talk about everything content creation. I'm Justin. I'm Eric. And no matter if you're creating from your cell phone or you're creating big budget films on a cinema camera, we're going to be here with practical advice to help you for the next time you hit record. On today's episode, this is very exciting. So we did our launch series and we wanted to cover the basis of each one of us um, between me and Eric, how we got into filmmaking and a little bit about our life stories and why we're here doing what we're doing today. So this episode is going to be focused on dids, Eric dids. And uh, we're just going to talk about kind of his upbringings and uh, how he started in the esports space and was a creator there and how it's kind of parlayed itself and pushed towards being a full-time filmmaker, business owner, and just man of many talents, Mr. Did. So um, yeah, so we're going to kick it off. First thing I've got for you is, um, you know, you started in the video game space and what with video games made you fall in love with them? Oh, that's a good question. You know, I think for me, like the 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 love for video games really just came from it was like, I don't want to say the reward because it wasn't like a gifted thing, but you know, Saturday nights, like, all right, you can stay up a little bit late. We'll play some Super Mario Kart together before bed kind of thing. So for me, it was always just like that. It was it was a way that I bonded with my dad, but also just kind of my own escape. Um, there were so many games that I loved back then um, that really it just was was that it was just fun. I mean, I don't know. Like, there's really nothing to it. It it just was something that I I did, and I was like, this is really fun. And I just kept and still do play video games. Yeah. So what are what are the top three games that made you fall in love with gaming? Number one, uh, number two, and number three. I'll give three real ones, but um, Super Metroid is top. Um, you want to talk about a game that has story. For the graphical limitations at the time you want to talk about a game that has so many elements and relatively speaking is bug free that is the game that i look to it's better than zelda i will die on my grave with that every super that. every super nintendo list it's like oh legend of zelda is the best game no 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 super metroid is the best game by far um growing up though you know the the other two that i probably spend the most time on you know roller coaster tycoon sim city I'll bundle those two together. And then third, I'll just say World of Warcraft. We'll be plain mm -hmm. and pretty generic there. Yeah, and um, you know, I know you pretty well. You had a uh, server for Roller Coaster Tycoon? I did, yeah. I, I When I was a Twitch streamer, I hosted a server for all of all of my community to come play Roller Coaster Tycoon together. It was like an open source, like community-made mod that allowed the, a lot to be possible beyond just the base game. So it was cool. It was cool. That's dope. That's dope. Gaming is like... I don't know, for me, one of those things that, you know, when you talk about getting away from things and taking some time for yourself, that's the way that I do it is, is gaming. And yeah. it's such, I think a lot of people resonate with that. So for you, what was the first thing or first way that you started making content around the gaming space? Yeah, it was interesting. You know, way back in the day, you look at YouTube. When YouTube was fresh, you know, there were companies that were like, oh, we can create teams and and have resources built in house ourselves that that pump out content and and get sponsorship dollars and you know before it was super corporatized you know there were groups like machinima that were were doing those sorts of things and had a team in house and you look at i looked up to you know hutch c nanners um sark i think was the other guy's name um and and just they were just making <laughs> It it sounds so, you know, you don't see it today because it was so rudimentary, but it was just, they're going to play a Call of Duty game. They're going to play for three hours. They're going to find a great game and they're just going to commentate over it. Could be talking about their life. You know, what is essentially the contents of a vlog from an auditory standpoint, but with the visual of a Call of Duty game. And I just, that that seemed great to me. I, I was a shy kid, so I was wanting to find a space to talk because I am... I always joke I'm the most introverted extrovert on the planet, so I do love talking, but in my own space, and this was kind of that way for me to do that. So I, I wanted to create Call of Duty commentaries. That was it back then. I don't, I mean, geez, like that sounds so long ago now, and, and so much has 
involved in the YouTube content space, especially with gaming. But that was where I, I started, and that was really where it became a, a process for me. Of, yeah. All right, I, I'm going <clears> to, <throat> you know, we have to play the game, get the footage, come up with a topic, script it out a little bit, bullet points, and, and put it all together. So that's really where that started. So you were, you know, you kind of got your your start when things really got, you know, kind of cool. And I think a lot of people would have loved this is you were making content for esports. Um, so tell us about that, how you got into that, and then how you pivoted out of that and, and your experience there and what you've learned. And that's helping you today with uh, Media Bolt Productions. I think the the biggest thing is... And, and I'm going to start with the advice and then I'll backtrack. You have things in your house that you use every day. That could be, it's, it's so hard to look at those. You're like, oh, I'm just using this keyboard. But it can be the, the subject of a great photo. Um, one of my most popular photos, I had a, a Logitech RGB keyboard and a red pair of their headphones. <laughs> and I laugh every time I see this photo because this was the photo that got them to message me to to you know do content for them but it you know you look at the desk and the desk has like you know scratch marks and like it's not like a clean photo by any stretch and this was before Lightroom had like spot remover that was really good and stuff so like I did what I could but it wasn't great but like I made the keyboard red colored to match the headphones I put the headphones down and I used everyday objects to create a story whether it was, you know, balanced by the caption or just the photo itself, you could look at this and, you know, it's a photo, so you might need to look at it a little bit deeply, but you could tell what was trying to be said here. The message there was, I'm a gamer, I just got done with the lawn session, it was a darker image, it was at taken at nighttime, you know, you put the headphones down, you got the keyboard, you're ready for bed, you just got done with a great day of gaming. And, and it was something that was so simple, but for me, that's where I took my creative outlet. My dad is a natural born salesman. He could sell catch up to a person in white gloves, as they say. And and <laughs> I think that's a saying. I don't really That's a good saying. <laughs> um but you know for, for me that that was my way of, of taking that genetic sales pitch of, of you know but but creating a story out of it because I'm just a natural born creative person. So for me, that was like the blend of those two worlds, and it was a perfect harmony to to really create something. And and I garnered a lot of attention. I was gaming, so most of that stuff was esports. So, you know, it became a thing where I'm, you know, getting messages from up and coming esports companies because that was when esports was really fresh. A lot of companies were trying to create the best product for you know whatever use case in esports. So for me, that was just the space to create those stories and i think it led to a lot of attention from from companies and you know there there was a a time where my twitter we talked about you know your twitter being verified as an athlete and doing that i i would be on a bad month at a million and a half impressions Mm -hmm. just from taking a picture and the retweets that that created from the company and all of their supporters between it as well. Like it, <laughs> there was a good 18 months where I was at a million and a half plus impressions every crazy. single month. Yeah. But just from, you know, you look at, you just think about a million and a half highs a month, just from taking a photo of the stuff that I use in my house every day. It wasn't the most expensive gear. It wasn't the most visually attractive gear. It was just what I was using and I created a story around it and it led to all of that. Yeah, and at that time, I mean, what the content creator wasn't a thing. It really wasn't. So people were paying photographers to come in and do product shots, and that was the end of it. You know, like you were a gamer that was proficient with a camera. That was a rare combination at that time. Yeah, I think it made a lot of sense at that time for companies because it, it was a gamer that wasn't as good as photography rather than a photographer that wasn't as good as gaming because yeah. I knew what I was looking for, even if I wasn't as good with the camera there was still enough there whereas on the flip side i don't think that that worked yeah that's a very very um interesting so then how did you know you got into esports what are a couple things you kind of did with the company and then you know yeah just tell us about that yeah so my first 
experience, and this is really a trial of, of tribulation, was MLG Columbus Gears of War. I forget exactly which Gears. I really wasn't a Gears of... I still am not a Gears of War gamer, but that was my first esports event that I shot. And I literally, you know, through me just being open and active on Twitter, I followed anybody that worked at MLG or had any relationship with anybody in MLG. And I, I messaged one of the, the people that worked there and I said, look, Columbus is, I don't know, six-ish hours, give or take, six and a half from me. I will drive there. I will put myself in a hotel. I'll pay for all of it. Can you just give me a media pass? And they were like, yeah. You know, Columbus is really our lowest importance event gears of war really wasn't a big game isn't a big game and that was like the perfect storm you're gonna to, get some hate from the gears com uh, community I, I loved watching that to me it was more entertaining to watch than call of duty events so that's my redemption arc there um but that was really you know my first experience to to sell myself and say look i'm not asking for anything but a media pass i will invest every penny into making this happen for myself. And it, it wasn't anything that had any restrictions or any requirements for it. He just said, sure, come. There wasn't any coverage of that event. So for them to get somebody to come for free, take a bunch of shots, it was gonna be great for them. And they ended up liking what I did enough to pay for me to go shoot a Call of Duty event at Las Vegas, MLG Las Vegas Call of Duty. And there I was, I'm, it was a weird situation. So I was there specifically to be the photographer for all of the booths. So all of the sponsors, you know, your control freaks, all of the companies would have booths there because it was a big enough event to, to house that. And I was supposed to go from booth to booth and be their photographer. Well, what they didn't really coordinate is that 95% of those booths had brought their own photographer. Mm. So it was it was kind of a an unfortunate thing. It worked out in the end, but I was kind of there, ended up being there as just kind of an extra time. It's like a third wheel kind of. Because there was nobody there that needed my services, but it really wasn't a position that MLG created prior to that event, nor knew if they needed in the first place, because this was kind of when companies were getting big enough that they could house all of those bits in-house. Mm. So it wasn't really a... a good thing or a bad thing I did what I need to do and and got a lot of good shots and honestly you know some of my favorite moments and maybe I'm answering questions in, in advance but you know the the moment that I look to that I'm like yes this is where it clicked there was a moment where there was a like the most popular um, Call of Duty player came in to do like a signing meet and greet during the event and I'm, you know, everybody's like, oh, yeah, da, da. and I'm like outside of the crowd and I'm just kind of like watching. And this was the first time that I did this and noticed something. And I, I get the shot every time that I get a chance to. So I'm looking and there's, you know, I'm there to take photos of what's happening. But who is there to capture the moment for the people? And it's great to look on Twitter and see a fan and their favorite athlete. You know, you were a professional athlete. How many pictures did you have taken? Like people look up to you, whatever. But for me, I want to be a step behind that. So there was one picture. It is one of my favorite pictures I've ever taken of this player and this kid. But I took a picture of the mom that was taking that photo. So I put my focus on her phone screen to capture not the moment, but the moment and for those that are listening not watching you know there's a a smaller moment that's happening with what she captured but there's a larger moment that's happening with what i captured of the story of the mom who brought her preteen very preteen kid to meet their favorite athlete she will have that photo on her phone that she took for forever but she's putting the one that I took in a picture frame because that's what means something to Amen, them. Amen, brother. 
Hey man, that's awesome. That, that was a bit of an aside. But. No, that was that was great, man. Um, but but you know, I just want to finish off by saying, how many times have you seen me? You know, you're looking at footage from something. I'm always looking for that shot of the phone. Who's who's out there taking a phone picture of something? Because again, you can post that picture and it's going to get whatever. But what's the story of that picture? What's going into that picture? I want to be a step removed from that so I can show the world this is the culmination of everything that's taking place here. Yeah, I feel like people get so caught up in selfies or just portraits or like capturing that moment, you know, whatever that is. But there's a whole like ambience in the room and in like an event that you're missing most of the time. And when you start to get like that perspective, like you did there, you end up seeing everything like you. I think you remember more of that sensation in that moment mm. by seeing more of that. That's that's really interesting. Um, I just wanted to ask you. So you you Twitch streamed a lot, Dids Live. And um, how did that help you, you know, maybe come out of your shell or just like find your voice as a as a content creator? Yeah, it's it's so interesting because everybody has a reason for streaming. Some of it is fame, some of it is financial, but for me, the the reason, you know, I, I was playing video games when I wasn't working as a kid or at school as a kid. And and then all of a sudden, you know, I'm like, you know, I'm taking all these pictures, right? And I'm doing all this stuff and I'm playing these video games. But when I'm playing these video games, I'm just kind of in my own world. I'm not talking to anybody. I have all of this equipment, though. I could just stream when I'm playing video games. There's no... I was single at the time. There's nothing else that I was committed to. So for me, it was very much a moment of, well, what if I just played it live for the world? I'm taking time to play three hours of Call of Duty, right? These Call of Duty commentary videos to play three hours of Call of Duty to get hopefully one good match. I wasn't great. So maybe I didn't get a great match there. And then I have to, you know, do all these exercises. I'm like, man, I could just put all that together and just do it live. So for me, that was where I began. And it, it really gave me a chance to kind of replay some of the old games that I loved and, and have passion for in, you know, streaming and, and stuff. And, it created a social point too because I was never I was never a kid that this is gonna sound so so bad, but like I do mean it literal on a face level. Like I didn't really have a lot of friends. So like for me it was like I wanna have people that I connect with, but that is kind of leveraging my lack of needing to be like, oh, let's plan to go out to dinner. You know, it was like kind of on my time. So it was a little yeah. bit selfish in a sense. But I, I created a community that way and, and grew into you know, a, a streamer that I knew I wasn't great at games, right? I knew that I wasn't blowing people away with, you know, anything cosmetic, stream, myself, whatever. But I knew that I could bring people here in, in my stream slogan from day one was always, you know, I want you to leave this stream with a bigger smile on your face than you had when you came here. So whether that was just brightening somebody's day with a fun story or playing a fun game, you know, I, I really just wanted to, to, to do those things so that people had a reprieve. I wanted to, to give a space, and I think that's just naturally my caregiver personality. I always focus on other people before myself, and you know, the reasons I stopped streaming aside, like, you know, that was what meant a lot to me, to be there for somebody, and you know, there was a moment where somebody came to my stream and was like, look, man, like, I'm sorry, I haven't been here lately. You know, I just recently got diagnosed with cancer and I've been in the hospital. I'm like, man, like that, that hits. Um, so my first thought was, man, first off, why are you apologizing? Like, that's, yeah, right. that ain't right. Like, you, you got to do what you got to do. But then my second thought was, how can we help? Immediately, that's what I thought of. So we got together, um, a, a, a charity stream 12 hours and and ended up raising with ironically the help of the creator of five nights at freddy's mm. before it like blew up he was just like kind of given back to a lot of streams and ended up raising like 1500 bucks which wow. for for a small streamer i mean i was a very small streamer even for that time was huge and 
you know, it was it was a blessing because the hospital that that this kid was at was on a list of of places that this program that I went through to to do the donations and stuff would donate to. And I did, you know, he came back to me a couple months later, like, look, it's sweet. Like, obviously, the fifteen hundred that we raised wasn't directly in into my room, but I'm I'm seeing those funds come through yeah. this hospital. And I was just like, man, that's, that's all you could ever want out of this. Dang, man. That's a, that's an amazing story. That's awesome. Um, I know you as like Mr. Gadget, you built so many different computers, emulators, you know, different things. What, where did you find that passion? Where'd you learn that knowledge? Like, you know, the, the Mr. Fix it, and also like just building PCs, like that's a very nuanced um, thing to have. Yeah, I don't think it's related, but I'm gonna bring it up anyway. My dad used to be a television technician back when they were tubes and 80 pounds per square inch damn near. And, you know, I never once worked on like a motherboard with him and, you know, never did any of that. But I think like, you know, genetically that maybe kind of got passed down a little bit. Because there, there definitely have been times as a kid where like, I want to know how something works. So I'm going to take it apart and I'm going to try and put it back together just as it was. And with that, I'm going to learn how each part of this comes together to create what I'm using. And that always intrigued me. And I don't really have, ironically, like a specific like thing that I like tore down. And, you know, everybody's like, oh, I, you know, I used to tear down our transistor radio every weekend. But like if something was was not working quite right. I was like, man, this, you know, there's gotta be just like a manufacturer defect or just something weird. But like, for me, it was like a cost thing. Like I could either buy this again, or it's probably like a $10 part for a $200 item that I could probably, even though I don't know how to weld or solder or anything like that, I could probably still just make it work. Maybe it's just a chip that I just got to boop, boop. Yeah. What? Who knows? But I'm going to, figure it out. And if I, if it's beyond my depth, then I'm totally fine to admit that, but I at least want to knock out that possibility. And then obviously, you know, being a gamer and stuff, it's like, well, I want to build the biggest, baddest PC. And you know, now there's really good reputable brands that will do pre builds and everything like that. And ironically, now I'm more a Mac user than a PC user, but a big part of, of what I do is still gaming on, on good old windows. And for me, it was, you know, Dad had the old office Dell Inspiron back in the day. And I'm like, well, what if we just put a graphics card in there? And then maybe I can, you know, play some games when we're not working kind of thing. So I just did that. And then eventually it was like, all right, well, let's understand the components of what makes this work. Because obviously time passes, electronics fail. So I've, over time, different parts of this thing would fail. And I'd be able to, all right, well, now it's just a new stick of RAM. Now it's just a new hard drive. Now it's this, now it's that. To eventually I'm like man, I can just build one. I, I know enough about all the things that are going into this. I can just build one. And I, you know, I had done research to know at that time, all right, I want this spec and th I, I have this much budget. So like it was my first really big boy purchase to be like, all right, I'm going to, this is mine. And looking back on it now, like it's bad. Like the case was, it, it was not the greatest thing in the world, <laughs> but, but it taught me a lot. And, and, you know, obviously, We'll get into it, I'm sure, but lessons that led to us having some very successful solutions today. Yeah. Yeah, that's a <clears throat> kind of leads us into the next thing. So Dids built Media Bolt Productions a custom NAS. And for people that don't know what a NAS is, it's basically a a way to store your footage or your files with a redundancy that backs up. Uh, so if a hard drive fails, it actually... It's in another place there so that you never lose anything. And he got so crazy to make it double redundant where me and him both have our own and they talk to each other and send files back and forth. So we have, if heaven forbid anything happened to one of our homes, we would have a backup solution at the other place. Um, so can you talk to us about that NAS that you created um, and why it was so important? And the function that, you know, we've had it for a month and a half or so now. Okay. Yeah, and what it's done to change kind of our workflow. Yeah, so what was very important, I'm going to start by saying anybody out there who's making content, 
Three, two, one. Three copies of your footage at two different locations, one off-site. That's bare minimum to have a, a well-produced. So with my time at the Misfits, that was very much a learning curve for all of us in that department. And there were times where we did lose footage. There was a time where I had something on one external hard drive and somebody came by and bumped it just with their toe. It was on the ground, my own mistake. And it, it just, it was just not a tall hard drive, just one of those externals and it just fell on its side. All eight terabytes, gone. So there were a lot of unfortunate phone calls we had to make. And from that moment, I'm like, this ain't happening again. So we ended up, you know, getting into the Synology system um, with some with some storage there. And that was only, you know, that was step one. That was just, all right, we're going to just have this thing. It's not by anybody's computer. Everybody can kind of have access to it. But that was very, very rudimentary. And I'm going to get a little bit technical for those out this there. I'm sorry. Dids is the technical. So for all you technical Justin people. Will, Justin will bring it back to earth in a minute. Yeah. So... You like this part. COVID happened and it went from, all right, we're at the office. I can go into the storage closet, plug in my hard drive, grab the footage and pull that hard drive out and take it home to now. Well, we're both at home. Meanable Productions, I'm just going to be transparent to this day, doesn't have its, its own strict office. The office is our offices at home. So for us, we both need to, one, have access to all the footage at all times, two, have it properly stored and backed up, and three, be able to edit that footage without as many steps. So what, what happened was initially through being an owner at Urmus Adventures, I did a Synology system. And Synology works great because it has a sharing, I forget exactly what they call it, but basically it copies the same files from one NAS to another. So we had one that was, you know, at, at, at our office at the time, and then one that was not, and they would talk. Now, the problem with this is that we couldn't edit off of it. And that was really kind of a big deal. So all of us would have to have a hard drive that was fast enough. We'd have to go through the effort of pulling the footage, doing the work, and then when we're done with the work, putting it back and not accidentally goofing that up. That's the that's the hard part. The hard part. Yeah, it's very easy to take the footage and do the work. It's very hard to be like, I'm done. Let me put that logo. Yeah, where it needs <laughs> yeah. To go yeah. On that's yeah. that's not fun. Uh, and honestly, when you're done with the project, you want to be done with the project. You want to do all the little extra piddling around. So we came up with a solution, and I kind of tested this on my own last Christmas. I bought myself, uh, I built another computer, and I just was curious. You know, there are other solutions out there. For for what we spec'd out for our NASAs now, it would have cost us double to go with the Synology solution. That's not a knock against Synology. Their, their price comes from just the, the convenience of it. But I'm a tinker. I want to find out what's the best, what's the most cost effective. We're running a business. We want to burn profit. So basically, the, the long story short is I found out through just testing, you know, I created myself a server that I just use at home. It's an unraid based server and I for a couple months just did all of my editing for our business on that. So we would come home, I'd do a project, I'd put it on that thing and I was testing it over two and a half gig internet to my Mac Studio, which has naturally 10 gig. And I was just curious, like how much am I pulling? How much bandwidth am I pulling? It ended up being about, you know, gig and a half, more than just a single normal, your standalone plug in the wall would be but not ungodly amounts, even with the bigger projects. So then I'm like, man, if I can find a way to have Justin and I have the same files at the same time, we could edit off of this and it would be fast enough that we would just be able to do all of this right from the comfort of our own home. And that was huge for us. And now obviously like when we do get our own space, it'll be easy to replicate it a third time over and really have, you know, long story short, we have 10 gig in these new NASAs for the business that we can plug into a 10 gig switch at the office and everybody that's editing for us at the studio can have full speed access to all of the footage and everything that they do is going to be saved into the same file structure that everybody else has access to so there isn't a did you finish this did you upload it did you finish this can i have it none of that anymore so now for us it's great because the internet speed that talks to the computers is fast enough that we can edit 
off of these NASs so that whenever we're we're done, so we're filming this podcast, we're going to go home, we're going to put it on the NAS. Overnight, it's going to transfer from one house to the other, Justin's house to my house. And then tomorrow morning, I can get working. That's huge. There's no, all right, we have to each have, you know, 18 one terabyte little Samsung SSDs and we got to label them and figure out what's on what and, oh, I need this clip from here and there. No, 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 no. Yeah, that's annoying, man. That's definitely annoying. And, you know, I think when you're building a business, you want to try to future-proof as much as possible. Um, When you're starting out, you may not have the funds or, you know, the money to, like, invest in the proper gear. So you kind of do that, you know, buy a little bit, move up, move up. But I would would tell anyone, buy once, cry once. You know, when it comes to file storing and when it comes to maybe, you know, getting a camera and different things like that, get something that's going to last you a while so that you're not every year needing to upgrade things. And, you know, with this, you know, we, we had conversations like how can we make sure that five years from now, 10 years from now, we have a process that we're doing, you know, we can just continue upgrading this thing and it's going to work. It's very scalable. Yeah. And it's, it's scalable to the point of anybody can be added into it mm-hmm. and, and whoever we add into the team can have access to the same thing. And I think that's that's super important as well. For sure, for sure. Well, tell me about like your evolution as a gaming content creator into now being a production company owner. Like, that's kind of a a huge jump and very different. Uh, just tell me about that process and kind of you know where you're at nowadays mentally and as a creative. The the crazy thing is, you know, I it was one of those things similar to like you learning filmmaking as a baseball player that I don't want to say was like top of mind for me, but in the back of my head, I I always wanted to be my own boss. I don't know why. I just always felt like I could. And it was, it was glamorous to me not to, to own my own business, to like have the nice car, the nice house. I still live with my parents. I'm going to be fully transparent about that. But for me, it was always like, I would, I just want to set my own schedule. And for me, being in charge of my own outcome is so glamorized in my own head. The work I put into something is going to directly be reciprocated by what I get out of it. And that was just always so cool to me. So as I'm growing in, you know, I'm creating YouTube videos. I'm like, maybe I'm a YouTuber. And then like, you know, that, that worked, but like it didn't, you know, I would have had to kind of become a little bit of a creature of the algorithm and kind of create stuff that really wasn't great for me. So I was like, nah. And then Twitch stream was like, well, I can just kind of stream whenever I want, whenever I'm not working. And like, you know, maybe that's something. And admittedly, like there was a time where I probably could have, but I I got burnt out. I had to take a break and I lost a lot. Like I was 150 concurrent viewers and I took a break and I came back and it was like six. Like it just wasn't. So, you know, and I never really got back that, that vibe. Um, so, you know... That kind of just led to, you know, I'm I, building a Twitch stream the way I built it is a production. You know, I didn't just go live on PS5. You know, I didn't just do that. Like, I had the webcam. I built my own overlays. I built my own, you know, coded in stuff to, like, follower alerts and this and that. And, like, I made it a production because I didn't want it to just be the experience of having it on in the background, although that was kind of the content that I was yeah. leaning toward. But... You know, I wanted you to be able to interact and feel like you were a part of it. It was a small enough community that everybody could chat and I could, <laughs> the chat wasn't zooming past, I could get to everybody. So it felt good. And that was kind of always my fear about growing too big. So I'm kind of glad I didn't grow too big because I always kept that and it yeah. felt good to always keep that. Um, but that was definitely, I think, the starting of the business ownership of it. Yeah, definitely. And then, you know, you were in esports for a while, and I feel like it was a place that it maybe wasn't exactly what you thought it was um, after you spent some time there, and because obviously you wanted to pivot and kind of make moves. Um, so, can you just tell us like about that and why you feel like you know there should ne- there needs to be some change in that kind of environment? Yeah, I'll I'll start with the story, and I've tried to put this in like three other places, but I just couldn't find a spot for it. So I'm just kind of going to put it here, whether, you know, it'll lead to answering that question. But I want to talk about the transition 
from gaming to filmmaking. So my first semester in college, I was going to college to be a graphic designer. Like every YouTuber needs a good graphic designer, right? So I'm like, I'll just learn it. Maybe I'd create my own thing. This was before I knew that Photoshopping wasn't gonna create you a $100,000 a year job necessarily for YouTube thumbnails, but I wanted to do it. And I knew that I, that was something that I could apply to anything that I did. So I did that in one of my first classes with one of my favorite professors that I still you know, have contact with every so often to this day was a 2D concepts class. And I always harp about gestalt rules, that's where I learned all of those on set. Um, but one of the first projects was create something that follows this set of guidelines. So for me, as kind of a, it wasn't a final send off because I still streamed after this, but like to kind of like put a period to the gaming, you know, side of things, what I ended up doing was creating a Call of Duty montage. And I did it to a song and it was like four and a half minutes. And I literally, it was so crazy. I, it was one of those things we got to sign like on a Wednesday or a Friday and it was like do the next week. So I spent that entire weekend playing Call of Duty and I only sniped and I only made a montage of sniping clips. Mm. So I had, I think it, it totaled up to be like 98 kills. So I think I called it like 98 kills or 98 problems with a killing one or something stupid oh, that was like okay, kind okay. of reference okay. to that. Okay. It wasn't obviously like a direct, <laughs> that wasn't the same number or anything, but it was clever. And I, I just remember like we presented it, right? And I remember the, I was like in the back of the room when it was being presented and it was so different from anybody that anybody else had made. But like in my, in, in my head, I'm just like crying of, of like, pride because i'm like man like i made this like the the gameplay sucked like it was not like incredible snipes by any means for a call of duty player but it was just 98 kills that i got with a sniper and i put it to music yeah but i put it to music in a way that was like a little edgy you know you can it's still out there on the internet you can dig it up but it, it was it was that first moment where i was like yes this this is it. And I'm trying to think if this would have been pre-shooting for MLG. So I think, you know, for me then, when I went to, to Columbus, <laughs> I had my Canon T3i. I had a 50 mil 1.8, a good old nifty 50. And I had the kit lens. So my, my kit was not great. Hmm. But I still made like a video and like manual focused and I like did little transitions and stuff. So, so for me, you know, it was that, you know, I started to realize like, man, I, I think I'm here more for the video than I'm here for the game. Mm. And I enjoyed that the content was the game, but I was there more for the creative. Yeah. And I think that was where, you know, over once you know, that second MLG Las Vegas came and, and went and, you know, it was kind of like they tried to create a job position that I would fill and it kind of just didn't work i was like man i'm gonna be okay because like it, it might not be a space for me and and i might not find a home there but there are lessons that i can take from this that i think are super valuable and, and again like i said like i'm the, the being able to, to have the kind is great but like now business right we do a lot of client work that pays the bills every business does that we we don't love or or dislike any project more or less than the least because, you know, we still love, we, we pull, you know, our love into every project and, and whether or not somebody comes to us to just do an event recap or something, you know, that on the surface is simple. We're going to have a meeting with them and be like, but what if? And that's the cool stuff. That's where we really have fun. But like, we still strive to find content matter within what we do that we love and you know some of the charitable work that we've done some of the you know other pieces that we've done really showed that but you know just because it seems bleak on the surface doesn't mean you can't have fun with it and you can't make it something special and i think we do that very successfully with all of our projects yeah 
definitely. Um, so where are you at these days gaming? Like, where do you find yourself most comfortable? And, you know, a little side note, you know, you met your wife through gaming and that kind of thing. So, like, you know, I know that's kind of changed a lot for you. And, you know, nowadays you have a much different outlook on you know what it means to be a gamer. Yeah, being a gamer to me is now so different because <laughs> gaming was part of what turned... You know, I always say people are like, oh, you know, I worked the nine to five. And I was always like, well, I was working the five to nine because from five to nine p.m. on the flip side, I was building my craft. And again, the content was gaming, but the real craft was the video, Mm -hmm. was the story, was all of that. So meeting my wife was super cool. So I was (laughs) there's a lot of funny to this. I was trying to build a graphic design portfolio. I was middle of of college, didn't end up graduating by the way. So Justin is a a bachelor's degree filmmaker. I am quote unquote YouTube university graduate, (laughs) but we we all got our same. But you know, I was like, man, I gotta build a portfolio. And I was like, all right, again, same thing with like taking pictures of stuff that I was using every day. Like how can I find it in something that I'm interested in? So I'm just scrolling Instagram on hashtag Twitch streamer. And I'm just, anybody that looks like they're like into it enough that like would continue to, I just hit them up. Hey, can I make you like some Twitch graphics, you know, build you a new like layout, whatever, banner, anything like that. And ironically, she's just one of the people that I messaged. There was no... You slid in her DMs. I slid in her DMs, but there was no intent. (laughs) I slid into so many people's DMs and none of it was for that reason. But she's like, yeah, sure. So I made her a graphic, and and then we're both like, man, they cute though. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we uh, were like, just kept talking, yeah. And and we're like, man, we, we should just like Skype one time and just like talk. Did you do you still have that graphic? I do, but it's buried like three hard. Yeah, it's out there. Dude. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it got to a point where we just, like, started Skyping and talking, and she was from Canada. I am obviously in the States. So it was a long-distance relationship for a long time. Yeah. We were long-distance for years. And the the thing that I take the most pride in that I love so much about our relationship is that since that first Skype call, that would have been in 2014. I'm going to get hate from her if I'm wrong, but I think it was, like, 2014. Um, Because I had just turned 21. So, yeah, that would have been about right. Um, We have either been on Skype or in person every single day since that day. So there's not Mm. been a day that in some capacity we have not seen each other since that day. That's dope. And we still ain't sick of each other yet, so God bless. That's beautiful, man. (laughs) But, but yeah, that, that was a really cool thing. So the funny part is, you know, when I went to visit her, I'd have to go through border crossing. And it's so funny because, you know, you always get asked, I mean, you know this, I'm sure when you're talking to Blue Jades, what is your reason for trip? When are you going? When are you coming? Where are you staying? Mm -hmm. You know, and I always be like, oh, I'm staying with my girlfriend. Well, how'd you meet? I was like, oh, gosh, because like the the answer is online. Yeah. But not like that. Right. You know, because you say I met online, you're thinking like dating site or anything like that. Like. Nah, I just made her like a Twitch graphic. Like we just like it's it's yeah. a little bit different than that, but like it's the legit answer. I'm like, I always just gave the answer. We met through a uh, mutual business interests. That's what I like to hear. Right? I, <laughs> I wasn't wrong. Like I'm not it's lying. True. Like it's very true. But did any money change hands on the graphic? Negative. No. No. Nope. It was a pro it bono. Was, it was purely for my own portfolio. Awesome. So yeah, it was it was interesting, but yeah, I always. Some some wouldn't ask that. I'm like, all right, this is a quick three minute border crossing, but some would, and it's like, all right, ten minutes later, I'm still they're still drilling me about this. It's like, man, it's legit, okay? I put a rain on it. Yeah. Relax. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, so then just so why was esports just like not the place for you overall? I think esports really wasn't the place for me just because you know it was one of those things where I everybody wants to go everybody wants to be in esports because they're like professional gamer 
is the top, you know, very similar, I'm sure, to how you feel felt as an athlete, right? Like you're like major leagues. That is the goal. So for <laughs> for everybody, you know, I was like, man, that's the goal. And and I think for me, I realized esports wasn't right for me because there was a point where I'm like, so I'm just gonna small flex. I was top top ten team. Call of Duty Black Ops 1, capture the flag. MLG verified. Back when it was like actually like game battles. Yeah. Damn. We 200 owed a team in a rank match. That's disrespect. Man. Yeah. Yeah. That's not nice. We like, we saw they weren't capturing their side flag and we're like, well, we could just go take it. And we were just like trolling and then we just never lost anything. We're like, well, I guess that just 200 owed a rank team. So that was pretty sweet. But after that moment. Damn. I really realize I'm not great at video games. I'm I'm slightly above average, but never good enough. And then with the the creative side of it, you know, like I kind of alluded to earlier, I realize, you know, I'm here for the the video, but the content is just the benefit, not the other way around. So I think then it got to a point where it's like, man, I, I really can do something with this and, and do something that makes a difference. You know, like I was saying with that moment that I captured through the photo. You know, how can I do that every day in my, you know, in a video format? It was photo at the time, but, you know, now obviously we've both really transitioned into, into videography, more of a moving story. But that, I think, was was really where I started to realize, like, you know, it wasn't like a moment like a flip of a switch, but for me, it's just kind of a gradual, like, natural transition of, like, man, I'm I'm here for the video. I'm here for the photo. At, you know, I was taking photography for MLG, but, you know, it's the content that's the blessing, not the other way around mm, that's big big news right there um so you as a creative you know what is your um you know because there's a lot of different things and nuances when it comes to filmmaking and kind of what we do where do you find yourself most comfortable in that space what do you enjoy the most out of the process whether it be you know pre post or production day um kind of where's your your comfort spot Man, I, you know, to make a baseball reference, I'm the utility infielder of this. You know, I, as Urban Misadventures, we all had to put on many hats. And I think I, I'm not saying this is a fault. It's just I naturally step into things <laughs> kind of by force at times. I wear a lot of hats. So I think for me, it's, it's something where I'm like, man, I'm comfortable anywhere that needs something to be done because I want to see the process done as a whole. And I also want to put people that I'm surrounded by as a team, like you were saying you're in your episode, I want to put people in their best position in the team. So for me, I would rather have somebody that's really good at one thing, doing that thing. Even if it means that like, I know that I'm going to be good enough to do anything on set. But if there's somebody that's better than me at that, I'm going to be, I'm going to have enough humility to admit that and want them in that position so that we get the best product. But I'm okay to say, that's fine, man. Like I'll do this, this, and this then, because then you get to focus on what you're really good at, because I know that at the end of the day, that's going to create the best story. So for me, I find the most joy in just filling in those gaps. And obviously, you know, we're trying to reduce that a little bit and create more structure. But for me, I just love, I love building that timeline. Um, you know, now that we've got this NAS situation, we get to a point where now it's like, all right, I can kind of, we're not all just working on a project and then like, all right, well, you know, I know for a fact I'm not grading nearly as good as you are, but I also know that, you know, I'm touching up audio with some fine tuning magic that, you know, maybe you don't have as much confidence That's in. That's for sure. <laughs> so, you know, I, I love just that tinkering and, and, you know, like I kind of alluded to as a joke earlier, like I will, I love being in the back and there, there is and there isn't a, an actual position for this, but like, I love you know, I'll, like I said, I'll be working my audio and then I'll like come look at all the cameras they say and be like, what if we just, you know, rotated five degrees and, you know, zoom. And a lot of times we're like, yeah, maybe most of the time we're not. But I like to, to be that second opinion because I think, you know, when we have a lot of minds on the same subject, we're going to create the best result. For sure. So I like to just kind of be that second voice in a lot of those situations. So where do you find your most flow, though? Like if you're like in flow, what are you doing? typically that's a really good question um i'd like to say it's audio but it's it's hard to find flow with audio because it is you know 
audio is all right you're setting up so you're not in the camera shot you're setting up so that you're making sure that you have redundancy you know we we always do two sets we do a boom and we do a lav and i've taken pride in you know getting really good at hiding the lav and making it not rustle on the shirt like man i used to be trash at that you know i look at some of the projects that done amazing that that. we used to do with with the misfits and how we would finagle cables through and around and i'm just like man that's so it makes me cringe but you know, you had to go through that to learn to where you are now. And I think I just find my most flow when I'm just, all right, it's 8 a.m. I got my cold plunge in. I got my run in. I got my coffee. I'm just going to build some timelines. Don't mm. turn off the world for a couple hours and let's just put some timelines together because building that story and, and you know, especially on bigger productions where maybe we're not shooting things chronologically and we're not capturing an event as it happens, you know, we're shooting things on the bigger productions in the back of our head, knowing exactly where that shot fits in that timeline. So to be able to say, all right, because we did such a good job with pre-production, our production went well. And now in post-production, all I really have to do is put things where they're meant to be. Mm. But seeing that when you're done with it, our Wisconsin vision commercial is a very good example of it is so cool to just be like, that's what we wanted. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Do you have a um, playlist? I know you do. A good playlist <laughs> that you like to go to when it's just time to cut and sync and do I've all that. I've got so many different playlists. I know I gave you the Deep House Relax, I think it's called. Yeah, Deep House Relax is a vibe. Yeah, that's a good Spotify playlist. I love the just, you know, Lo-Fi Girl, great mm-hmm. playlist. But what I've done recently, mm-hmm. that's very interesting. New tip alert. Yeah, new tip alert. Um, this is going to sound out there. Animal Crossing lo-fi. That's probably fire, bro. It's so good. Because, you know, for me, it takes me back to when I was 13. It was a Friday night. You got all your homework done. But you're staying up until 2 a.m. playing video games, right? Yeah. And what are those? What are the soundtracks to those moments? I think it, I'm sure there's science behind this. And I will definitely be the one to find out. But if... You know, there's got to be like a, a naturally calming nature to those moments because it takes you to a point of comfort from your childhood. Mm-hmm. So you're naturally just like, <clears throat> you kind of get to create the flow because it's like, I work better with music. I know that there are pros and cons to it. Um, but to have that in the background is like, all right, now I can just whoosh, right in. Go right in. Go right in. What, um, what skill are you looking to kind of improve on or finding more interest in to try to kind of learn more about currently? That's a great question. I really don't know the answer to that because I feel like we've gotten, <laughs> I mean, it's good. Sounds, we've gotten really good. Like from even just where we were when we started this business, we've mm-hmm. gotten really good. I mean, we were not doing B-roll with light and now we're bringing on a, at least a Pavo tube for all of our B-roll and it's made a huge difference, you know? But for me, I think it's just like how the skill, maybe it is a skill, how can we take what we do and make it more efficient? Mm-hmm. And in that, and also right now it's the two of us. It's not always going to be not the way we plan in our business. So how can we put processes in place? We're huge into notion. We love that, that software so much, you know, how can we get everything ready to go processes in place so that when people get hired or people are contracted on everything just flows right flows, through. For sure. So maybe that's just an organizational skills of business. Owner. I know that that, it isn't directly related to filmmaking, but I think it it applies just the well, same. Yeah, and then there's, I think a lot of the thing I think we've been fortunate is, you know, a lot of people, they build a company or they're individual contractors, so it's hard to sell just one person. Mm-hmm. But when you have a team, you know, it's easier to sell it as a production company. Yeah. And we've kind of approached it that way, but then we've got to be able to be, you know, have that business acumen as well so that we can, you know, elevate your 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 product right like there's a lot of people that just make dope shit right and are amazing creators but they just don't get the business side of it and it's sometimes really hard when you're not kind of balancing both and i know we talk about this all the time we're like man i'm just spending so much time doing business stuff i just want to be making you know and but that just comes with it that comes with it and i think as business owners we've got to understand you know I think we're very good at know, knowing that, you know, 50% of our time is business. The other half is production, you know, planning, whatever, that part of it. And um, 
the more you do that, the more you can elevate, you know, what you're doing. Because really, truthfully, for this podcast is a business um, venture in a way. It is a a pillar yeah. of the brand that we hope the right. business can be. And we're pushing it that way. And that's why it's, I think, going to be successful for us because we're not just – we have a, a rhyme and a reason to why we're kind of trying to put this together. Um, yeah, and, I mean, is there anything else you want to leave us with? And, like, what do you – what do you see yourself? Where do you see yourself in you know five years from now, and what do you hope to accomplish? Whether it be with this podcast, our business, or just kind of personally. Yeah, I think the 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 professional answer is, man, I just want to have fun. And I think we've been really positioning ourselves lately, especially to do that. You know, we've been blessed to be on some incredible projects, and you know, we've had meetings recently where they're like, you know, it's, it's nice to be with you guys because we can see that you genuinely care about what's happening here. And I always say, and I, you know, I learned this from some coworkers at our misadventures. We want to be experts in our field, but we also want you to be an expert in your field. We're going to go do a video for, let's just say a sports drink. We can do our research and we can do all of that but at the end of the day we're going to bring our expertise as storytellers to your expertise of sports drink so we want instead of just saying you guys come up with a plan or we come up with a plan let's meet let's come together let's work on this plan together and let's really do a good job at, at bringing this story home so that your vision is brought through but we're putting our storytelling spin on it so that it's done but done more effectively and i think that that's something that that we do really well is is supporting that and and having humility in in those faults there are we're not supposed to be an expert in every field we are storytellers we are video storytellers that's what we do so it'd be just a a straight you know fallacy to try and say that that we aren't there that we are experts in their field definitely definitely man i I really enjoyed this conversation. You know, I've spent a lot of time with you over the last couple of years, and um, this is a different feel to just be able to sit down and just have this conversation like this. And hopefully, the viewers learn more about you. and um, And I'm just really thankful for having you here today and us doing always, this, man. Like uh, we always joke, this is our FaceTime conversation. So this is you're getting it. We're bringing our FaceTime convos to the internet. <laughs> I just want to sign off there and just thank everybody for watching or listening to this episode. I don't know which way you do it. We've been having a little battle back and forth on how people consume content. But no matter where you are, can you subscribe, like, uh, just hit all the positive buttons on your screen, wherever that may be. And we just thank you so much for coming and checking this podcast out. And uh, have a beautiful, blessed day. Peace.